I'd like to do two things in this brief reflection over the next 20 minutes, half an hour. I want to touch on the hermeneutical problem or the interpretation problem of the Bible. What often divides people of good faith is they will hold high the important centrality authority of the Bible, but they differ on the interpretation of the Bible or the hermeneutical problem. The hermeneutic just comes from Hermes, the Greek God who delivered the message of Zeus to um, the citizens of the time. And so the hermeneutical problem is people can agree on the authority of the text where the great disagreements occur theologically, exegetically, denominationally on how we interpret the Old, the Apocrypha, the New Testament, and the Christian tradition throughout its 2,000 year old history has grappled with this. The second part, I want to apply that to a couple of the early chapters in the book of John because in many ways St. John uh, put in place a, a very sophisticated hermeneutic that anticipated the Alexandrian tradition of Christianity that we find in Pontinus, Clement, and Origen as the most mature in that sense. Uh, but first, first the hermeneutical dilemma because if we don't understand layered ways of reading the text, then inevitably people collide in how that's to be done. Just one thing to note before I, I move in this direction. If someone wanted to be a pilot, you expect that you'll take training, you'll sit in the cockpit, you'll understand um, the laws of physics and flight, uh, and as you go through that course you become a pilot. If a person wants to be a doctor, then there's certain training. If a person wants to be a dentist, there's certain training that uh, is expected wants to be an electrician, there's certain training, a plumber. We live in a period of time, sadly so, in which people think they can just turn to the Bible and interpret it any way they want with no training whatsoever. And as a result, we live in the chaos of all sorts of bizarre Sunday school interpretations, reactionary interpretations. Uh, they're absolutely uh, inadequate in terms of understanding how the history of the church has interpreted the text in a thoughtful way. And so proper training in interpreting the Bible is foundational. Two texts which are probably important in terms of the church tradition, one and all should know so that their approach to the Bible is not just Sunday schoolish in that sense or elementary or rather infantile or immature, is Augustine's work on Christian doctrine. On the one hand we hear the word doctrine but it's for much, very much for Augustine it was about how one interprets the text and the six levels of interpretation of the text. And then by the 16th century, August, or, uh, Agrasmus's work, which draws on Augustine, consciously so, it's, uh, it's reflections on how you do a true theology, but what Erasmus is talking about is theology to him is exegesis. And in this particular missive, or it's actually a larger text that was a part of his 1519 edition of the New Testament, which became a book in and of itself, he lays down the means, the structure, the method by which thoughtful, mature interpretation takes place. And so if anyone is interested in a meaningful sense in terms of biblical interpretation, Augustine's on Christian doctrine, Erasmus's reflections on and on true interpretation are really standard texts anyone should read before they even get to the Bible. But often what happens, people do end runs on the mature thinkers of the faith, like Augustine, Erasmus, and needless to say there are many others, and they just come to the text as if somehow they're not bringing their own um, conditioning, socialization, denominational background, rather than being instructed, educated, and informed by the mothers and the fathers of the church itself. And so when we think of hermeneutics or interpretation, there is a history in terms of which the church has given to us as a gift by which when we approach the text, we interpret it in a thoughtful, meaningful way. I might add there are six levels in which the church has always interpreted the Bible. Uh, one is the literal, the linguistic, the historical, grammatical. And then there's the, the, the typological or the allegorical or Christological. Then there's the tropological, or the moral, or the existential. Then there's the anagogical, by which a person looks at where this is all going in terms of the end or the telos. There's the ecclesial, and then there's the mystical element. So there's six levels of interpretation by which most texts 
if understood properly, can be interpreted and applied in a meaningful sense. And so the church has given us this layered approach. Now what's happened, sadly so, as we've moved from the Reformation forward, is the church wanted to be as empirical and factual as certain forms of science, then the literal, grammatical, historical approach came to win and dominate and subordinate other forms of interpretation. So, for example, two interpreters of the Book of John today, the Roman Catholic Raymond Brown is considered a, one of the most significant Catholic interpreters and readers of John. Uh, he's going to give a certain read, but coming from this tradition, uh, the, the literal, grammatical, historical, and N.T. Wright, coming from an Anglican evangelical reform tradition, his work on John, even though they differ on how it is approached in a literal, grammatical, historic way, they both share those premises of that's the way to approach the text. Now the reaction often to that particular approach is, well, let's swing over to the mythical approach, the allegorical approach. So one of the leading journalists, religious journalists in Canada, Tom Harper, did The Pagan Christ, and he turns vociferously against the literal, grammatic, historical, and he wants to just do the mythical, and he just sees Jesus as one great mythical savior, messianic figure within the tradition of Egyptian history, classical Greek thing, and so Jesus is, he just fits into that Osiris, Dionysius, Horus tradition, and that's the mythical overreacting and um, silencing the literal, grammatical, historical. A better interpreter of the mythical in Canada, of course, would be the great Canadian literary critic Northrop Frye, who never rejected uh, the literal, grammatical, historical, but he also saw the mythical approach and its perennial significance in terms of how we interpret things. I might add someone like Jordan Peterson today is certainly not at the same level of a Northrop Frye in terms of that mythical approach but he also is also not going to buy into the literal, grammatical, historical tendencies. And so there is this hermeneutic dilemma which has developed over the last 500 years in which some very much posit themselves in the linguistic, historical, grammatical tradition. There's others will swing to the opposite extreme like Tom Harper and as I said, the pagan Christ or uh, water into wine. Uh, there are those like Northrop Frye and Jordan Peterson, who's very popular. They're much more concerned with the mythical and its existential relevance to each person's journey. And so the best way, if we turn, as I mentioned earlier, to an Augustine or an Erasmus, it's not either or, it's how each both reveal and conceal and each layer will reveal things to us on our journey, but it will conceal elements and so the higher up you get, you get unconcealing, uh, which is hidden. If I can use two analogies, which often the church will use, is a, um, a, a, a nut or something, an acorn, has a hard exterior, but inside when you break that, you get to the kernel within. And so just the literal grammatical, in that sense, is the hard exterior. You crack that, you get into the meaning of the text for each of us on our all-too-human journey. Or the rind of an orange. The rind of an orange protects the sweetness of the orange, but as you peel back the literal, you get into the sweetness and the tastiness for the soul on our all-too-human journey. And so the, the, these uh, metaphors, which have been used by the historic the church, in terms of the spiritual interpretation and the literal interpretation are very essential. My wife at the present time is going through a lot of Ephraim, uh, Assyria's works, and he makes a very clear distinctions between the literal, its significance, its place, but the spiritual uh, is about the significance of the text for people's self-understanding uh, in terms of their journey, the same with, same with Isaac, Isaac of Nineveh. And so within the, within the Syrian tradition, within the Western tradition, within the Eastern tradition, there, there is a historic convergence in terms of ways of which the text can be interpreted that does not deny the historic, but it also speaks to people in terms of metaphors of transformation, self-understanding, and deification itself. And so we need not react. Now, I'd like to move to look at how John uh, a fourth book of the gospel applies this in many ways. John anticipates in his layered exegesis what is going to go on in the Alexandrian tradition of Christianity, of which uh, Pantinus, Clement, and Origen were very much a part. And John was a, a contemporary of Philo of Alexandria, the great Jewish exegete who looked at layered ways of reading the the Hebrew canon or Old Testament and its significance existentially for each person on their journey. 
So what I'll do is I'll start just to touch on the initial parts of the initial prologue of John, then move into John 2 and the wedding of Cana of Galilee and then the cleansing of the temple. So first of all, often John 1 is interpreted in an establishment sense, as in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. Now, the two words here are used as einarchy in, in Greek, or it's translated often as beginning, but archi comes from a Greek word, archons. The archons in the city-states of ancient Greece were the protectors, they were the guardians that kept the city safe and secure, and so we can also translate um, in beginning as at the ground of all things, the guardians, the protectors of all things was often as translated was the word. Now logos, which is the Greek term here, has often been translated as word or sermon or discourse or rational principle. Logos from the pre-Socratic era, from Heracles, as Parmenides, uh, T.S. Eliot picks up on this also in his fine work of poetry, The Four Quartets, is that uh, Logos can mean presence, the presencing of that which is. And so Logos need not be interpreted as word, rational principle, sermon, reflection on ideas. It can be the, the presence of that which is, or the I am in the Hebrew sense. So if we were to look at even those first few lines of what John is getting at and look at an alternate uh, interpretation, it could be at the ground of all things, the guardian of all things is the presencing of that which is. And so, uh, this, this takes us in a little different direction in terms of the eminence of God being active in guarding and protecting all things. And so how is Christ really pre-incarnation present in, in that process in, in humanity? Um, you'll also, as you move along in this, look at how the darkness and the light um, engage. The Greek word here, there's two Greek words for uh, overcoming, in this case in which the 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 light sees through or overcomes darkness. The Greek word here is is a cognitive understanding of what uh, what darkness can do, how it can blind people to insight, to wisdom, how to live meaningfully. But it's a little weaker on the will, and we all know a person would be aware of things they have to overcome. But is the will that does the overcoming? There's another word later that uh, John will pick up, and uh, Revelation uses it even more. We get a word Nike comes from that. Nikao is the will and the mind coming together. Uh, to overcome darkness or shadows, as in Plato's cave, in that sense. But let me just move on to John 2, in particular, the, the, the wedding at Cana of Galilee, and see what John is doing with this in his layered exegesis. So the wedding at Cana starts with, and the third, the third day. Well, why would John insert third? What's the significance of third? Well, th three is obviously uh, within the Christian tradition, and both the, the myth of death, and resurrection, and dying. And so John is alerting us right away to the fact uh, that he's taking us into a story in which we must die to that which we are not, we must let go to that which we are not, so we may resurrect into our new being. What is the nature of that new being? Well, we're into the nature of the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And that's a, now, the whole notion of wedding and marriage raises the question in terms of human identity. Where do we turn to for meaning? Because inevitably people will people marry other people or other things for the purpose of happiness, meaning, fulfillment. And so the question of marriage raises the question metaphorically, not just literally, because literally there is the wedding of Cana. But what are we married to for meaning? Where do we turn her for hope? What are the issues that people uh, become wed to, become united to, their desires, their longing, their purpose, turns to for meaning? Because marriage is about directing desires, uh, shaping longings, ordering desires, amor ordus, as, as, as Augustine would say, towards meaning so that lesser desires are subordinated to higher, higher desires in that sense. So three, death, resurrection, dying to lower uh, desires, rising to higher desires through that which we are united with mystically. 
And so marriage is, of course, the great metaphor, wedding that you get in what John is articulating. Origen will pick the, up this in the Song of Songs. There's a whole history of mystical theology that Bernard of Clairvaux, of course, will celebrate. Gregory of Nyssa will celebrate. Any of these great theologians of the nature of our highest longings toward, uh, turning towards the ultimate rather than being taken captive by penultimate or anti-penultimate issues. So you get marriage as a metaphor. So third day, what do we die to to resurrect into the mystical union not only with God but with one another which is what the church is all about and of course the marriage metaphor is very very much as the great exegetes of the church would use in Song of Songs the marriage of the soul to Christ or the church to God and so picking up the Song of Songs Cana of Galilee uh, we're dealing with not just a literal interpretation in that sense of which Cain of Galilee is a historic, literal reality. Uh, but it's also, it's also very much a typological or crystal, which puts then people into the confrontation of uh, the, the tropological or existential of uh, what do we turn to for meaning? Um, and if we turn in the wrong places, what are the consequences of that? And the anagogical leads us to the end destination of certain desires and consequences, not only in the human short journey, but the larger questions of the end of the human journey, journey itself, and what's the relationship of the church and, um, and uh, the mystical union, not only the individuals, but the communion of saints to all of that. So you have the marriage, the marriage metaphor also, and then the water into wine. So just as you have three days, death, resurrection, um, water is the first couple of days, wine is the third day of resurrection. So the natural life, uh, is converted into the deified or the wine of life. So here again, we're we're moving beyond the literal uh, into the Christological. And Jesus is the wine. So here you have the allegorical Christological. But as people are united with Christ uh, tropologically, uh, they become deified into the wine wine of our our new being entirely. And that transformation takes place existentially, step by step through time, and finds its fulfillment. Uh, eschatologically at the end of time both within the church and the human soul on its journey and so what you have is if this is and so the word archi my dad is used here and so what's often tr it's translated just as John 1 is in the beginning was the word so this is often translated um, as this was the first of Jesus's miracles but again, Archie can be translated as this is the ground of all miracles. This is the beginning. This is the guardian of all the great truths, the Cana of Galilee um, reality historically, but parabolically, uh, it's also the story of trans, which is going to set in stage in one sense all the book of John, John itself, where he's going to go through other chapters. The second part of that, the second part of that, of course, is the cleansing of the temple. This is Jesus' first trip. Uh, to the Passover, interesting in John, it's three again, he does three trips um, to the Passover. Now the Passover can be read historically, literally, it was really the journey of the Jews from oppression in Egypt, uh, so political oppression, you had power, powerlessness, the Jews were the post-Joseph's period, they were the hewers of wood and drawers of water, uh, and so at a political economic level, they are liberated from, from oppression, the movement out of Egypt into the desert where they have to let go of things and of course the price of freedom is very very difficult because it's even though a person can be oppressed there's a certain predictability in Egypt and the price of freedom is letting go of a certain securities predictability uh, support even if it's under an empire and all of a sudden the sheer emptiness the lack of predictability of the desert uh, politically and, and as a nation as they're leaving towards um, the promised land which of course is just an ideal in their minds because they're in the desert where there's uh, they're not quite sure what the journey is going to look out you get the complainings you get the Moses of course is constantly pleading for the people and Aaron has to deal with all of this so the desert is a, a, a place where all those things we once held near and dear in terms of security uh, is gone uh, in that sense, but this also can be read metaphorically. So, I mean, Jesus is, in that sense, the Passover. So it can be read as a, a historic event, turned ritual, a festival, and left at that. But Jesus is at the Passover, in that sense, he is the Passover. So you move from the literal to the Christological, 
and of course the Christological takes a person once again into the tropological or the existential. So what's the nature of each of us is we have to leave the comforts of our Egypt, our security, our predictability uh, in the human journey, the ego, the shadow side of the ego, misdirected desires. Uh, what does it mean to, because we often take comforts in Egypt, all it can give us, even though we may kick against the pricks as it were, of it, but we only will come to our true freedom, but there's a price to be paid for freedom. It's leaving behind the false self, the ego. And so many of the great uh, mothers and fathers of the church read, read the exodus from Egypt in a philosophical, spiritual sense as the departure of the false self into our new being. And so again, the, the Passover itself can be read at various levels and just as the cleansing of the temple. Again, you have the literalists who think, okay, literal Passover, historic event in Jewish memory, ritual that comes from it. People gather in Jerusalem at the temple to celebrate it. Jesus is going to move it away from merely the literal without negating it, but it's real meaning in that sense. He's cracking the nut to get to the kernel. He's peeling back the orange skin to get to the sweet juice of, of the eternal truth. The second part, of course, is the cleansing of the temple where he comes along and he basically says, destroy this temple and in three days, and we're back at three, very, very important numerically and understand what John is attempting to do, anticipating a whole complex layered way of reading the text. And I will rebuild it again. Now the literalists come along and they say, well, it took us decades to build the temple. How are you going to do it in, in, in three days? And of course they're literalists in that sense. He's speaking spiritually or um, typologically in that sense and arguing that yes the literal can be seen as an end in itself temple Passover or it's a portal it's an icon in that sense into the spiritual and the spiritual is both uh, tropological and typological as well and he's and of course they're baffled by him at a literal level saying how can you possibly rebuild a temple in three days he's not talking about the literal he's dealing with the spiritual you get the same thing in a later chapter say Nicodemus in chapter 3 Nicodemus he's a ruler of the Jews interesting enough Nico uh, comes from a Greek to overcome um, and Nicodemus is Jesus says you've got to be born from above sometimes it's translated born again but it's, the word is actually born from above or spiritual birth and Jesus says there there has to be a death to just the literal the literal is not in, in itself enough for deification for transformation uh, there has to be a spiritual birth from above and only as that occurs then will you begin to see the true meaning of the text because the text is hidden or concealed from literalists it's only revealed or unconcealed to those who want to journey towards the light uh, but those who cling to a literal is, is its own form of darkness in one sense. But it's a beginning. And so within this layered or hierarchy of exegesis, uh, each step of the journey reveals deeper things to us on our journey of transformation and deification. But if a person gets stuck at one level, uh, they miss the deeper or the higher truth. So the, the higher always includes the lower, the lower excludes the higher. And so in this hierarchy of exegesis or hermeneutics, uh, one is exterior, one's empirical, the other is increasingly inward and transformative. Uh, and so the text, and John knew what he was doing, uh, he was a part of an ethos of layered exegesis. And so to sum up, the whole issue of hermeneutics is uh, an area that again and again people have to think more seriously about and get beyond purely the literal and the Bible itself is the pointer or the way marker or the pathfinder uh, in terms of looking at layered uh, exegesis that the early fathers and mothers of the church, the post-apostolic, the early patristic of East and West, the Syrian tradition itself, will pick up on. Now, sadly so, uh, with the coming to be of elements of the Reformation, those higher levels or deeper levels of exegesis get lost. The lower excludes the higher, but within the classical tradition, the lower is never rejected, and the higher person goes in exegesis or the more layered the various ways of interpreting the text are offered as gifts to the human soul, mind, and imagination. And John is really the forerunner in that sense of offering the church the layered exegetical tradition which the patristic medieval tradition will pick up on that got lost in elements of the Protestant Reformation but elements of the Orthodox, uh, Anglican, Roman Catholic, 
and uh, Syrian still maintained, but they tended to get marginalized. And then you get this ongoing debate about whose interpretation of the literal grammatical should win out and why. Gratefully so, there's a return to layered exegesis going on today or hermeneutics and hence uh, a much more sophisticated understanding of, of um, spiritual directing, uh, layered exegesis and the meaning of that for the individual, the church and public responsibility.